recording. Okay, now I will start the share screen. Uh, try not today. Okay, uh, today we are talking about uh, BRICS uh, being Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South America, uh, Africa. Um, these are the BRICS countries. Um, of course, the largest landmass is Russia, and then is China. China had the second largest landmass among the BRICS country, and then India here, South Africa here, and Brazil in the um South America. It represents about 30% of the world's land surface, 29.5, and about 40% of the world population. Uh, we have the two largest uh, populated uh, countries in the world, uh, India and China. Uh, India just surpassed uh, China to become the country with the most uh, population, uh, I think earlier this year. So that represent about 3.2 billion uh, people there. In terms of global GDP, uh, the BRICS countries uh, have been improving uh, quite quickly, uh, quicker than the developed countries. In 2001, excluding South Africa, it represents about 8% of the world's uh, GDP. But to when it comes to 2022, it represents 26% of the world GDP. The per capita uh, income, Russia represents the highest, uh, is uh, 15,000 uh, US dollars uh, per person. China coming as a second. And then Brazil, uh, South Africa, India is way off there. Uh, it's only about 2,000. So India is a very interesting country in that sense because uh, India uh, has the most population at the moment and is, um, is also the lowest in terms of GDP per capita. Okay, a little bit of history. Uh, BRICS is a acronym, uh, of course, taking with the first uh, letter from the English name of the five countries. Uh, initially, it was only four, and then later on, South Africa is included. So it is Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. In 2001, it was coined by a Goldman Sachs economist. Jim O'Leal, uh, in a paper titled Building Better Global Economics, BRICS. Uh, he identified these uh, four countries as a emerging economies with the potential for significant global entrance. Uh, it turned out to be correct. So in 2009, uh, the first summit was held in Russia. These four leaders come together and discuss uh, ways to enhance their cooperation and address common uh, challenges. 2010, they invited uh, South Africa to join, and so BRIC become BRICS. South Africa's inclusion expanded the geographic representation of the group, adding a country from the African continent the first BRICS summit with Africa took place is in 2011. From then onwards, BRICS holds annual uh, meetings, annual summits, where leaders of the uh, member countries will meet and discuss uh, a wide, wide range of issues, uh, mostly economics, politics, security, and global governance. Now, Notice that it is not an alliance, so there is no treaty in a sort of say uh, if uh, a country is being uh, invaded, that all other countries will have to help 
No, this is not a alliance. It is only a cooperation. This summit provides a platform for dialogue and cooperation among the five nations. Uh, later on, they really put these ideas into uh, action. So the economically, uh, they cooperate to form, to establish a new development bank, NDB, also known as the BRICS Bank. And they also, in, in within this uh, NDB, there is a contingent reserve arrangement in which um, these five countries uh, lump together a significant, a significant amount of their uh, foreign reserve to form a pool in order to protect um, the stability of the currency of the five uh, countries. In terms of politics and uh, security, BRICS primary purpose is economic. But of course, with economic, you have to also address political and security issues. They also encourage cultural and academic exchanges. Uh, there are, of course, uh, challenges and differences, despite their shared objectives. BRICS countries have diverse economic and political system, which sometimes lead to differences in approach and priority. Now, from the political structure, China has its own political um, establishment. We have been a one-party state. The Chinese uh, political system is based on a, pi a primary election at the lowest level. And then from that onwards, it's all in direct elections. The lowest um, so-called village um, CC, uh, CPC, uh, Village uh, Chinese Communist uh, Party of Com uh, Communist Party of China, CPC. The lowest level may be a village. And in that village, the um, threshold to participate is very low. Uh, basically, you had you have about five nominees, then you can you can stand for a, a office, and it is a direct election by uh, that village. Maybe a hundred people, two hundred people, maybe three hundred people, etc. So they elect their uh, village representative in that sense. But the next level up, for example, from village into county, then the county represent uh, rep officials are elected from the village representatives. So all these uh, villagers get together and say, okay, who want to uh, stand for office in the next level up? Then you can nominate and then uh, indirectly voted by the village representatives to go on to the next level, into the uh, county level. And similarly, the county officials will be able to get elected into the next level up, for example, the province level. And from the province level, you get to go to the next level up into the uh, national con uh, member of the National Congress, et cetera, et cetera. This is one way up. And there's also other um, so-called groups, for example, um, minor ethnic groups, then they will have represent representative directly in the uh, National Congress. So there are other channels similar to what I, I have described for the most uh, area in China. All these people get to, get to the top. Uh, slowly. Uh, usually, um, they have election every five years. So if you want to go from the lowest level to the highest level, it will take about 25 years and so on. That is the uh, political system in uh, China. India is also has the largest uh, political party in the world, and they have a common election electing their president. Similarly for Russia, and the other countries. So 
in terms of um, political system, there are diversities. But in terms of economics, we also see a huge diversities. Uh, India is a, is a very much emerging economics uh, from agriculture to service industry. Uh, India is very much in, uh, focused on uh, high-end service industry. For example, we know that in Australia here, a lot of call centers is actually rou routed to either uh, Bangladesh or India, where um, their workers take our call and then perform whatever necessary. So in, this, in, in that sense, not exactly an industrial um, powerhouse. It is a so-called all-rounded uh, economy. Whereas we know that uh, Brazil is a very much a agricultural a heavyweight in terms of corn, soya beans, and sugar canes, etc. Uh, Russia is also a huge resource-rich country, typically oil, gas, a lot of uh, uh, resources like aluminium, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Also, Russia is the second largest um, nuclear power after United States. The number of uh, nuclear warheads between um, United States and Russia will represent about 90% of the world's all nuclear warheads. And America and Russia have about the same number of nuclear warheads. So in terms of military, Russia is another level. Uh, it's a totally different level from uh, the other uh, BRICS countries. And it is also resource rich, very different from, for example, China. China, we know that it is the world's uh, manufacturing hub. Uh, China is the largest trading partner with most countries in the world. Uh, it produces a large number of uh, commodities, goods, etc. So the, these countries is very diverse and they have very different um, political agendas as well as socio-economic uh, backgrounds. So getting this group of people, uh, countries to, to cooperate, I think is quite a challenge. And by this year, 2023, um, RICS accepted another group of countries into uh, its organization. So it is now uh, known as BRICS Plus. Break plus, okay. Uh, the sixth country being added is Saudi Arabia, Egypt, United Arab Emirates, Argentina, Iran, and Ethiopia. Here is the map of these countries uh, in a slightly different color, uh, the orange color. So the new BRICS Plus is interesting in a sense that it enlarged the representation of BRICS. For example, uh, previously, Middle East is not represented with the BRICS countries. Now we have uh, three Middle East countries included Saudi Arabia, uh, UAE, and Iran. They are Muslim uh, countries. But in terms of uh, belief, Brazil is very much a Catholic uh, country. Russia is the uh, what's, what's the, um, Orthodox, uh, Orthodox Christian. Uh, India is, of course, Hinduism. China is almost, you can say, is a non-religious um, country. It's atheist country, at least. And South Africa, I don't remember. I probably, I believe it will be. 
whereas now added the three Muslim countries into it, or maybe four. Egypt is also Muslim. Uh, e Ethiopia is also Muslim. So suddenly, five Muslim countries added into the BRICS uh, mix. Argentina, I think, is uh, Catholic. So in terms of religion, it has now a broader representation. But in terms of resources, Saudi Arabia and Russia together represent a significant amount of the oil we serve in the world. Of course, we know that America at the moment is also a large uh, oil exporter. But anyway, Russia and Saudi have a very strong uh, ability to control the price of oil through OPEC and OPEC Plus. Now, Russia do not belong to OPEC but belongs to OPEC plus because OPEC, again, the uh, oil producing uh, countries has expanded to include a few countries into the OPEC plus and Russia represent a huge uh, ability or potential to control worldwide oil, oil price. Now, together with um, Saudi Arabia in the break plus, the control of oil, global oil price is very much in the hand of the BRICS plus uh, countries. In terms of resources, uh, ah, don't forget Iran is also an oil rich country. And EUA is also an oil rich country. Argentina is again a uh, significant agricultural countries complementing with Brazil. Uh, you look at the uh, map there, Brazil is very much um, easier to ship its goods to Europe rather than to China, for example, because it will have to go either around the tip of the um, South America or through the uh, Panama ca uh, Canal and then pass through the Pacific Ocean. Whereas Argentina is on the side of the uh, Pacific Ocean. So cooperation between that has a lot of potential. This expansion ex expanded I think I have the information much. Um, the GDP is now expanded to uh, 29%. Look at the new part. The green part is not very significant uh, in terms of GDP because uh, the new countries are either small or not very rich. But in terms of population, uh, we added some population to it, it now represents 46%. So remember it was 40 and now it's 46%. It's quite significant. But, but the most significant part is actually oil production. With Russia, Saudi Arabia, and Iran added to it, then its oil production represents 43% of the world's uh, global production. Finally, the export of goods with the new added, then you will represent some much much higher uh, adding abilities at uh, represent twenty five percent. And in terms of global GDP, um, the BRICS has already overtaken a G seven. Uh, this is BRICS, not BRICS plus. So it overcome at around 2021, around this time, where the BRICS uh, countries GDP over overtake the um, GDP of uh, G7. G7's GDP has been uh, declining, whereas the GDP of the BRICS country has been rising. Uh, they are almost complementary because most of the growth 
in the world's growth is in the developing country, especially represented by China. We may, um, until recently, uh, China's uh, annual global uh, GDP growth is uh, two digits, 10%, something like that. Uh, lately, when it dropped to about 5%, everybody said, oh, China is in big trouble. It's only 5%. But remember, the average GDP growth of the developed country is sitting at about 1% to 3%. And this year, we are looking at around 1% for the developed countries. With uh, Germany contracting rather than expanding. So um, that represents uh, the uh, change in fortune of the developing countries. The role of China in BRICS Plus. Uh, this um, picture comes from um, a, a gentleman called Robert uh, Goodfield. The blue part represent US, USA and the red part represent uh, China, but it is a GDP in PPP. Uh, that means purchasing power equivalent. So China GDP um, in terms of PPP overtakes the United States in April 2014. April 2014, when China's uh, GDP in terms of purchasing power is the same as the uh, United States and then China just take off. China has a huge influence in um, BRICS countries. First of all, it's as a founding member. It is the most populous country at that time. And it is uh, e economy, uh, its GDP um, economics is also um, la largest among all the uh, BRICS members. Uh, China has the largest economy among them. So together with what we talked about last week, the Belt and Road Initiative, China formed two banks. One bank is, of course, the Asia Invest uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB. Almost at the same time, China also uh, formed the New Development Bank together with the BRICS country at that time. So, Belt and Road Initiative, trade investment, China is the major trading partner for almost all the BRICS countries and actually is the largest trading partners with almost everybody else in the world. Political influence, um, Chinese political influence is substantial. Uh, um, it has been involved in shaping the group's collective stance on global issues such as climate change, global governance reform, international security, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And its foreign policy is quite independent and does not align exactly with the other BRICS countries. Cultural, culturally and academically, China is also actively participating. At the moment, one of the, uh, the BRICS countries represent two seats in the United Nations Security Council, which have veto powers, Russia and China. And of course, we know that India is trying to uh, become a permanent member of the Security Council, but I think it won't come anytime soon. In terms of technology and innovation, uh, recently China has surpassed everybody else to become the largest uh, scientific paper producer in the world. And in terms of uh, patent registration, China also has surpassed uh, the rest of the world to become the number one patent uh, restoration in the world. Um, 
just like domestically, China is a multicultural um, countries. We have different minor ethnic groups. So expanding that concept into international, supporting uh, multilateral and multicultural um, global governance order is quite uh, a trivial extension. We could recently heard a lot about a rule-based international order, but unfortunately, uh, we haven't seen the rule books. We don't know what is the uh, rule-based international order is. Um, what we can see is that anything which is against uh, American interests is not rule-based international order. The BRICS country, however, also call for a global governance uh, reform, which is based on the United Nations Charter. So when we talk about rule-based international order, we have two choices here in terms of similar terminology. One is what um, the Americas and the Western media uh, call rule-based international order. Unfortunately, nobody have ever seen the rule books in that rule-based international order. But on the other hand, just like the BRICS country, including Russia, China, talk about a reform of global governance based on UN um, charter. With China's participation, BRICS influence in terms of global politics and economics is much enhanced. Um, is it has provided opportunities for cooperation on various funds, including economic development, infrastructure investment, uh, diplomatic efforts to address global challenges, etc. Um, the influence of China within BRICS also lead to differences of opinion and priorities within the group, given the diversity of members, countries, political systems, and interests. Okay, so I will concentrate on one or two aspects of this. Of course, the first one is the economy, the New Development Bank. It's referred to as the BRICS Bank. Initially, it was established by uh, pulling together the resources of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Given their relative um, difference in uh, GDP, so Brazil, Russia, India contribute the same share. China contributed almost twice as one of them. And then South Africa is about half contribution as Brazil, uh, Russia, or India given uh, South, Africa, uh, South Africa's lower GDP. So basically the, the, the BRICS Bank, I think is um, 15 to 18% by Brazil, Russia, India, or 20%. China is a bit more, about uh, 40%. And America, uh, South Africa is the, the rest of about 10% or 5%, something like that. The exact percentage, I can't remember, but um, China is the larger contribution to to the uh, BRICS Bank. At the moment, the new Development Bank headquarters is in Shanghai, and the president is the uh, previous uh, Brazil president. The capitalization is a hundred billion dollars. Uh, uh, each country contributed 10 billion to the initial capital. And it will be expanded. Uh, it is a mainly a lending instrument for providing uh, infrastructure and sustainable development. Um, it provides loans to both public and private sector. 
The focus is on transportation, renewable energy, water supply, sanitation, um, urban development, among others. Its finance is based on local currency. Now, this is very important in, in the near future, as uh, I think I will touch on touch upon that a bit later on. It focuses on renewable finance or green finance, and it is also uh, investing together with other uh, global uh, financial institutions such as World Bank and other regional development banks, such as the Asia Development Bank, uh, mainly uh, supported by Japan. The NTB governance is based on a board of directors and each and the management team and each um, member country has a seat in the board of directors. The credit rating of MB, NDB is pretty good. Operationally, they focus on projects in member countries, but it will be expanding its work into other countries. Part of the reason why the other countries want to join BRIC to become BRIC Plus is the assessment to this funding by NDB. Here is a um our Australian outlook about the BRICS summit. The last BRICS summit is in South Africa. Is uh on twenty second to twenty fourth August in Johannesburg. The focus is on partnership for mutually accelerated growth, sustainable development, and inclusive multilateralism. Among them, um, all the uh, heads come to this summit except uh, Putin. Uh, Putin uh, is not able to travel to South Africa. So we have uh, China's President Xi Jinping, uh, Modi from India, Brazil's uh, Lulu, and South Africa's uh, President all participated in this um, summit. We can identify about six um, outcomes. First of all is, of course, the BRICS expansion, which include, as we had, Ex I explained that uh, Argentina, Egypt, Ethiopia, uh, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and U United Arab Emirates. With these six new um, members, it represents about 30% of the world's economy, etc., etc. The second is Important is uh during this summit, the leaders of BRICS declared their intention to reduce dependency on the US dollar and to increase the pace of de dollarization in global commerce. Um at the moment, US America um, America's um main uh Global power is based on, I think, several uh, pillars. One pillar is, of course, is military. Uh, United States has the largest uh, expense in its military ex budget. Um, U.S. military budgets equals to the next, I think, eight countries combined and more. So one of the uh, power of U.S. is dependent on its military. The second major power of United States, of course, is soft power, represented by 
the control of major Western media, including Hollywood. But we know that when we talk about uh, media, it's almost like we are talking about uh, Washington Post, uh, New York Times, CNN, etc. These are um, America uh, soft power, uh, of course, including the entertainment, uh, Hollywood films, etc. So that is is second um, pillar for its uh, strength. The third pillar is um, is technology. Um, United States is one of the most technologically advanced uh, country in the world. Is um, scientific research, is um, registration of um, patents, is still ranked number two at the moment, uh, being overtaken by China uh, just recently. So with a huge accumulated um, control of the intellectual property of many of the current technologies, uh, United States remain a very strong uh, technological uh, countries. But all these, the one, two, three pillars, are all supported by the Americans' ability to print United States dollars and these printed papers or numbers uh, is able to almost get everything it wants. This is a huge uh, privilege because you can basically uh, grab any resource by printing money and then using that printed paper to grab the resource. So once if that uh, ability to print uh, money is decreased, then this ability to support a huge um, military, this ability to continue to support the global soft power, as well as the innovation will subsequently decreased. So this uh, reduction on the dependency on US dollars and the dollarization will almost signal a decline of the global US uh, power in almost every measurable sense. Of course, uh, if then um, the dollarization comes as a sudden change, then it has very significant uh, impact on global economy. So the best approach at the moment is a um, slow approach, uh, slowly the dollarizations so that risk is reduced and it has been a major outcome from the last BRICS summit. Um, of course, we know that the um, BRICS countries has now agreed that um, the trade among them will not depend on US dollars. It will depend on mutual currency. If it depends on mutual currency, then the next one is, will the BRICS country create a currency similar to Euro, which is a common currency for the uh, European Union? Or they will depend on a basket of different currencies to do the trade. If it is the later, that means using a basket of currency. Then the largest currency in that basket will be the renminbi because of the size of the Chinese economy. 
And therefore, even if renminbi will not become a world's trading currency, it will become a major trading currency among the BRICS members. We already know that uh, Saudi Arabia and Russia is selling their oil to China using renminbi. The third outcome is uh, the summit strongly expressed the leaders' intention that inclusive multilateralism and global governance could be achieved by promotion of efficient representation, effective democracy, and reform of international organizations. Um, one reason why China, instead of uh, increasing its share in, say, the World Bank or the International um, Monetary um, IMF is because, first of all, United States unwilling to give up its veto power. And therefore, if China's share becomes larger than United States, inevitably, uh, China will acquire that veto power. So because of that, China's participation in World Bank and IMF is very much limited. And because of that um, unequal uh, setup, China is more interested in setting up a much more fairer and more um, equal um organizations. So that is why uh, China think a reform of the international organization is very much needed at the moment. So that's the la last part. And China emphasized its um, right to govern or its uh, legitimacy of government by being a responsive, effective government. That means this government is able to meet the citizens' need. Rather from what we uh, in the West commonly use as the legitimacy of government is of voting. China doesn't believe that. China says, oh, the, our, our government is legitimate because we address uh, Chinese citizens' concern and is able to deliver what the Chinese government uh, citizens wants. So effect, uh, efficiency is very important. And second one is, of course, a democracy. In the West, we equate democracy with election-based government. But we all know that uh, election-based governments have its drawbacks. For example, um, when a different party is in government, many of the work by the last uh, government will be uh, changed. One of the main things I complain a lot is, of course, the NDB. Um, uh, NBN. Uh, National Broadband Network. Initially, it was talk we are talking about optical fiber into the house. But when Labour government lost, then the coalition changed it. And we are now suffering from a very low internet speed, especially when compared to China. Another thing is about the so-called 5G network. From the Chinese point of view, what we call 5G is to them 4.5G. And we know that we have a trade war between United States and China started by the last US President Trump. And with the current president, Biden, that trade war becomes technology war. 
and one of the outcome of that technology war is that um, America want to limit the growth of uh, electronics companies in China, especially Huawei. And therefore, um, it it banned Huawei, Huawei's involvement or, or sell of its product in Western countries, including Australia here. We, um, most people know Huawei by its um, handsets, but the main strength of Huawei is actually its infrastructure, the delivery of 5G towers and of course the 5G towers. By excluding Huawei in building our 5G network, our 5G network is very slow. China represents about less than 20% of the world's population, but it has about 60% of uh, 5G towers in the world. And most of them built by Huawei. And therefore, you we understand uh, the uh, political implications there. The fourth important uh, outcome is the members agree to extend their support for an African continental free trade agreement. That means America African countries will have free trade among them, and BRICS will be also having a free trade agreement with African uh, countries. That means goods between the BRICS countries and the African countries will be free of uh, import tax. And the fifth strong focus is on agriculture and green economy, uh, which I think we don't need to stress too much. Finally, the last major development occurred during the summit where both India and China agreed to set up an effort to reduce the tensions at the disputed border between China and India. At the moment, China has almost resolved all the border issues with its connected land um, countries, except India. So if that last part is resolved, then uh, China will be surrounded by uh, countries, at least by land, with concrete boundaries. So, here we have a very brief um, ex expose of um, bricks. I will stop here and then you can ask me question. So I stop the share. So you have any questions, please unmute yourself and then I, I will try to answer, answer it for you. Anyone? No? <laughs> okay, now next year, I will be still doing uh, China Today um, three times per term, and again on Monday at the same time. But the dates will be uh, available when uh, deep Dean set their timetable. <laughs> so the timetable will be set by Deep Dean. And Nick's um, um, first term in 2024 24 is in February, if I remember correctly. So I have already sent the dates to the coordinators in the other UVAs. Okay, any other and any questions? No? Thank you. You're welcome. For this year. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. In that case, we'll finish. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.